No Doubt's early history was peppered with tragedy, a messy inner band romance, a major lineup change, and a first record that literally went nowhere. The band by the mid-90s were left wondering whether they'd ever release a new record, and it didn't help that their record label showed little to no interest in them as well. But by late 1995, No Doubt would release one of the biggest records of the decade, but that success also came with its own set of problems. The story of No Doubt begins with frontwoman Gwen and her older brother keyboardist Eric Stefani. They would grow up just south of LA in Anaheim in Orange County. The pair would grow up in a family who loved folk music. Their father, in fact, was a guitar teacher in college while their mother played the auto harp. Eric's parents would pay for his piano lessons, but it ended up being useless since he could just play by ear and he never learned to read music. Eric and Gwen would grow up in a Catholic family, which is what Gwen blames for her worst faults, being closed off and not open enough, revealing in one interview, my brother was an artist since the day he was born. He would win all these awards at school. I didn't have to do anything because I had him. I was always a passive person, a one-on-one -on -one person. I always had my one best friend and I didn't have a lot of girlfriends. I never have. It was from the age of two, Eric was drawing everywhere he could, whether it was on the walls of his house, on school desks, which of course landed him in detention as well. But other kids soon took notice of his skills and he was soon drawing for another school's newspaper. The LA Times would write a profile on Eric in 1996 where he told the paper, I was messed up inside. I was troubled. I didn't know what direction to go. One of Eric and Gwen's first musical influences would be ska music when Eric brought home Madness 7-inch single, Baggy Trousers. They soon got into other groups like The Specials as well as The Untouchables. It would be Eric who pushed his younger sister Gwen to help him co-write their first song together called Stick It In The Hole. No, it's not a Steel Panther song, it's a song about a pencil sharpener. Gwen would recall to Rolling Stone how Eric pushed her to perform for the first time at a school talent show covering on my radio from the ska band The Selector. In addition to being a fan of ska music, Gwen was also a fan of The Sound of Music as well as Evita. It was in 1986 Eric and Gwen were working at a Dairy Queen and working alongside them was a fellow high school student, a black punk rocker named John Spence who really modeled himself after Bad Brains' HR. The trio soon concocted a plan to start a band, originally calling themselves Applecore before changing their name to No Doubt taking inspiration from a phrase that Spence used to say. John would be the main vocalist while Gwen did backup vocals and Eric played the piano. Their first gig would be a backyard party that lasted about two songs before bottles started flying, noise complaints came in, and the cops eventually showed up. Gwen would tell Spin, we sucked, but for some reason there was automatically this built-in following. People loved the fact that it was a girl, that it was two-tone, that it was me and John up there. But at that first show of theirs in the audience was a bass player named Tony Canal. Canal would befriend No Doubt's drummer, who admitted to him they weren't really a fan of their bass player, and soon enough, Canal got the job. In addition to becoming their bassist, he'd also become their manager and archivist, and within three months, him and Gwen were dating. Canal had played the saxophone in jazz band in high school. He wouldn't pick up the bass until he saw a graduating bass player perform, Telling a Knoxville paper, he was a really cool guy who was getting all the girls. As for his romance with Gwen, they would keep it hidden from their bandmates, fearing that they may not react positively to the news. Gwen would tell Spin, I forced Tony to go out with me. He wasn't even interested. When we made out that first night, I think he thought it was more of a one night kiss. But then we started going out and after the first year, I was going, when are we getting married? Kanal would be born in India, raised in England, and his family relocated to California when he was just 11. Eventually, his parents opened up a store in Anaheim called Kanal's Gifts and Fashion. Gwen would tell a publication, they're such beautiful people, referring to Kanal's parents, and they have such open minds, especially in their community, because all their friends' kids are rich and going to Harvard, and here was Tony in a band with a white girlfriend. As someone who's of East Indian background, I can totally relate to what she's saying. As for that bindi that Gwen wore on her forehead, that was said to have been inspired by Tony's mother. No Doubt was soon playing gigs on the Anaheim party circuit and in LA doing some shows alongside Red Hot Chili Peppers, as well as ska groups like The Untouchables, and they also did some gigs with Fishbone as well. They would even play with Bad Religion, whose fans they finally won over after just four songs. 
There was even one gig that No Doubt played inside a photography store at a local mall. The earliest incarnation of No Doubt would be a nine-piece group, combining their influences of ska groups like The Madness, The English Beat, and The Specials, along with the stage antics of the punk group Bad Brains, no doubt quickly established a name for themselves. Stefani would also talk about Spence's time fronting the group, saying he, referring to Spence, couldn't really sing, but he could yell and he was really amazing on stage. He did backflips and was really energetic. Despite his onstage performance and friendly personality, to those who knew Spence, he could be quiet as well as introverted and rarely made mention of his troubled home life. It was by December of 87, Spence would sell his clothes, his scooter, and a number of his records. He had recently crashed his father's car and had split up from his girlfriend. It was on December 21st, 1987, Canal received a phone call from Eric, recalling to spin. He just said, come over right away. I, I got there and he said, John's dead. Turned out the front man had taken his own life while he was alone in his car in a parking lot of a local Anaheim building. All of those who were close to Spence were shocked at the news and didn't see any warning signs of what was to come, at least initially. It was several days prior to his death, Spence had passed his driver's test with bandmate Alan Mead recalling he was so happy. Spence's death would come four days prior to Christmas and he would be just 18 years old. No doubt had been together for about nine months at the time of Spence's death. In the aftermath of his death, those close to him would reveal that the frontman had tried to take his life once before. His friends would also reveal that the frontman had a strained relationship with his father. And given what she knew about his background, Gwen was still shocked at the news recalling, I knew he had problems with his family. I knew he had problems with depression in high school. But when it happened, things were so normal. It was awful. It was horrible. For all the years I knew the guy, I only went to his house one time, but compared to my family, the Brady Bunch family, church every Sunday, it was different. Before Spence's death, no doubt, had booked a gig at the LA venue, The Roxy, for December 30th. That was supposed to be the band's big break. No Doubt was opening for The Untouchables that night, and many bigwigs from the music industry and A&R people were supposed to be in attendance. So now No Doubt had a decision to make. What do they do next? At the time, they decided to make the planned concert a farewell show to Spence and to split up. Eventually, the band would sit down following that show and decided to continue on, feeling that's what Spence would have wanted them to do. For a short period of time, Alan Mead, one of the band's horn players, and Gwen would share vocal duties until Mead left the band around 1989, reportedly after getting his girlfriend pregnant. Gwen would permanently front the group. It was during this time Tony and Gwen also revealed their relationship to their bandmates, and they really didn't think much of it, as they were still reeling from Spence's death. No Doubt would eventually cement their best-known lineup over the next several years from 1987 to 1989. Guitarist Tom Dumont would join the group in 1988 after seeing a flyer for the band. Dumont was a hard rock and metal fan, taking inspiration from the likes of Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, and being a massive Kiss fan. He would leave his metal band at the time, which was actually fronted by his sister, it would also turn out that DeMont had rehearsed in the same complex as No Doubt when he was in his other band. The guitarist would admit to the Vancouver Sun he was initially reluctant to join No Doubt, but finally said yes because they sounded so different than everyone else. Dumont also had a much different upbringing than the Stefanis, being the only adopted child of a family of three kids, and his parents would later divorce. Meanwhile, 18-year-old drummer Adrian Young, a fan of ska and punk, came on board in 1989. It turned out he was a huge fan of No Doubt before he even took up drumming. Young would in fact lie to the band and told the group he'd been playing for eight years when in fact, he'd only been playing for about a year and a half. In addition to being the final piece of the puzzle, Young was also set to be the exhibitionist of the group being the only band member who'd play naked sometimes. Young grew up to hippie parents with his mother leaving when he was pretty young. With the new additions to the band and Gwen fronting the group, no doubt went from being a strictly ska band to having a wider sound with Canal telling the LA Times. A year into the band, it evolved. We decided we're going to write with all the different music we like. We brought in some punk and funk and metal, some hard rock, it just opened up. 
Having Gwen front the band was sometimes challenging with her admitting to Blender in 1995. When I first started singing, there weren't many female singers in the scene. Whenever we went to a club, I'd always be looked upon as the tag-along girlfriend. Where's your wristband? But as soon as I finished the show, the same people would say, ouch, I can't believe you're up there. While groups like L7 and Hole were popular during the early to mid-90s, Gwen didn't really identify with those bands, instead being more drawn to Blondie. But getting attention from record labels wasn't easy, largely because they weren't really into ska music. It wasn't until No Doubt hooked up with promoters Golden Voice that they started doing more headlining shows at the Whiskey and Roxy, and they soon found someone at the talent agency William Morris who set up an industry showcase for them where Interscope, Chrysalis, and Atlantic Records showed interest in the band. No doubt intended on releasing their first album in 1990 and self-financing the whole project. Canal would tell the Spokesman Review, we were headlining shows at the Roxy and Whiskey, but there was little industry interest. We recorded the album with our own earnings in 1990, but by the time we were finished, we started getting offers. This was now around 1991, and one of those offers came from a guy named Tony Ferguson, who was with Interscope Records. Ferguson went to a No Doubt show and was shocked to see people stage diving. Ferguson soon brought along Jimmy Iovine, Robert Court, and Ted Field, the industry heavyweights behind Interscope, to see the band perform. Iovine would reportedly say at the time, and I quote, that girl will be a star in five years. Iovine knew the group was young and still needed a lot of work, but soon enough, no doubt, nabbed a recording deal with Interscope and set off on recording their debut album, which would be self-titled and put out in 1992. The group's first album was largely based off their demo tape. No doubt would see frequent comparisons to Red Hot Chili Peppers, who they previously played with, in addition to Susie and the Banshees and Fishbone. It was ahead of their self-titled debut record coming out, the Spokane Chronicle would state about the group, and I quote, there is no doubt that No Doubt will be one of the rising stars over the next two years. Their debut album would be released in March of 1992, and it would be primarily written by Eric Stefani, who was the principal songwriter in the band. It would deal with everything from toothaches to heartbreak, but it would end up being a huge commercial disappointment, selling around 30,000 copies. No Doubt would soon hit the road with their seven members and five crew guys, and they would tour across America in a van living largely off Taco Bell. Their single from the record Trapped in a Box would struggle to get radio play, and the band even self-financed a spectacularly low-budget video for the song, which would be shot at the Beacon Street house, as it's called, the home where the Stefani's father had grown up and where the various members of the band ended up living. One of the program directors for the iconic LA radio station K-Rock even told the band that it would take an act of God for them to get played on the air. With radio and MTV too preoccupied with grunge by early 1992, their debut record really got little to no attention. Interscope soon pulled support for their tour, and soon enough Gwen and Tony's relationship was also splitting at the seams. Things were really not looking up for the band, and soon enough they'd also lose their principal songwriter. It was during the tour for No Doubt's first album, Eric seemed to slowly drift away from the other members, often sitting in the tour van by himself. As No Doubt turned their attention to their second album, things were only made worse when Interscope suggested producer Matthew Wilder to work on their next album. Wilder was really only known for the 80s hit Break My Stride, and Eric didn't like the choice of producer and didn't like outsiders telling him how to write music. Adding to the tension was that Wilder pushed the band to work on one of his own songs called Walking a Fine Line, which they didn't count themselves a fan of. They would eventually scrap the tune. However, no doubt would end up working with Wilder, but it was a long process that took nearly three years. Canal would tell Rolling Stone, one of the reasons this record took so long to come out was that we withstood a lot of pressures and we were unwilling to compromise on a lot of things. Tragic Kingdom is a battleground. It was the outcome of three years of struggle. The band's label continually rejected a lot of the early material that they wrote. The members of No Doubt were soon left to wonder whether their new album would ever come out. By 1994, No Doubt would see fellow Southern California rockers like The Offspring face to face and Pennywise gaining national attention. As grunge's popularity was winding down, publications like Rolling Stone were proclaiming that punk would be the Orange County sound in both 1994 and 1995. Gwen would tell the San Bernardino County Sun, we would read the national media, the big magazines saying how the Orange County scene is exploding, but we'd never get included in those listings. 
Adding to the problems was tension between Eric and Tony. And even though Eric was the principal songwriter in the band, he encouraged his bandmates to write as well. But then when they did, Eric seemed threatened by it. It was in 1994, both Gwen and Tom wrote what would be the first song for their second record titled Just a Girl, a song that Eric didn't count himself a fan of. It was by the fall of 1994, Eric, suffering from depression, stopped turning up to writing and rehearsal sessions, and he soon quit the band. Having previously done animation for the Fox television show The Simpsons during its first two seasons, he eventually nabbed a full-time position there. Eric would remark to the LA Times, it was like being the father of a kid and it was time to let go. Eric would go on to add that everything prior to 1992 was perfect in the band, but he was just sick of major label politics and dealing with long tours. With Eric leaving the band, their future seemed more in limbo than ever. No doubt thought, okay, they'll release their second record, it'll probably fail like the first one, they'll disband and the members will just simply go to college. But some of the early reviews of the band's second record even claimed that Tragic Kingdom was too diverse for mainstream consumption. With Eric leaving the group, songwriting soon fell into the lap of the remaining members. Gwen would tell the Modesto B, the last three or four years, I started writing my own lyrics and songs and it made this album Tragic Kingdom special because it's real. I was singing his songs about getting his wisdom teeth pulled or something and I haven't had my wisdom teeth pulled. The rest of the band would also write more somber music than the upbeat Scott tracks they'd previously been known for. For Gwen, she would use the opportunity to write about her breakup with Canal, penning songs like Don't Speak, Happy Now, Sunday Morning, a song which even calls Tony a parasite. Gwen at one point would even call up Tony, letting him know that she wrote a song about him, which was Happy Now. Of course, he felt conflicted, but at the same time, thought that Gwen should be able to express herself. By early 94, Interscope gave the band the green light to begin recording their second record. No doubt, at one point, were worried about keeping their fans waiting and opted to release 10 songs that Interscope had rejected. They would release a compilation of songs on a record called the Beacon Street Collection on the band's own Beacon Street label. They wouldn't even tell their label they were making such a move, only selling it locally in California and at shows. The band would reveal to the Albuquerque Journal that their label didn't even care about the release even though they weren't technically supposed to do it. The song Total Hate 95 would feature Bradley Noel of sublime fame. By mid-1995, Interscope would introduce No Doubt to Trauma Records president Paul Palmer who loved the group and wanted to take over as their main label. Trauma was financed and distributed by Interscope, and the move is when things really kicked into high gear for No Doubt. It's important to note that No Doubt was only one of three bands on Trauma's roster, with one of the other bands being Bush. No Doubt's third album, Tragic Kingdom, would take its name from Disneyland with Canal telling the Sydney Morning Herald, it's really polished on the outside, and then you take a closer look and it's just like everything else. It's not as clean on the inside, it's a little more rotten, just like the record industry. No Doubt would hit the road a few months before their third album was set to be released. The band originally envisioned touring for maybe several months to support the album and then they would go in and record their follow-up. Tragic Kingdom would see an October of 95 release and the first single, Just a Girl, would be put out several weeks prior to the album coming out in September and it soon blew up. The song would be born out of a discussion between Stefani and Dumont about trying to write a new wavy song similar to Devo's Whip It. The lyrics would be inspired by Stefani's dad, who got mad at his daughter for going to Tony's house one night and coming home late past her curfew. Gwen's brother Eric would tell the LA Times that he had tears running down his face when he first heard Just a Girl on the radio. Just a Girl would become a staple on radio and MTV. The song would end up peaking at number 23 on the Hot 100 chart, and the song also was included in the movie Clueless, only boosting the band and the song's profile. The video for Just a Girl would pay homage to where the band members came from in Orange County. The house featured in the video is where they all lived for a time being and wrote songs for their album. The single Just a Girl also established something unexpected. The media attention seemed to focus solely on Gwen, given the name and subject matter of the song, and the media soon made it seem like the other band members were merely backup musicians. It would obviously create a great deal of tension and resentment within the group. 
The second single would be Spiderwebs, which was released a month after the album came out, and it was another smash hit. While it was never released as a commercial single, making it ineligible for the Billboard Hot 100 chart, it still peaked at number 5 on the Alternative Airplay chart. Then in 1996, No Doubt dropped their third single, albeit not a commercial single once again, in Don't Speak. The song went through many incarnations, with most of the original song being written by Gwen's brother Eric. Eric came up with the melody in the middle of the night, as well as the title and some initial lyrics. Gwen would take the song the following day and soften the lyrics before she changed them to reflect her breakup with Canal. She would tell The Independent, It used to be more upbeat, more of a 70s rock type thing. When Tony and I broke up, it turned into a sad song. Don't Speak would become the band's biggest hit, becoming the most played song on the radio in 1996, spending 16 non-consecutive weeks on the Hot 100 airplay chart. Aside from the personal issues within the band, some of the reviews that came out for the album praised it for being catchy, as well as a good mashup of rock, disco, and ska-based pop and reggae. Suddenly Interscope, who had long ignored the band, finally woken up. They got no doubt a tour bus, they hit the road with 311, and by 1996 they were opening for label mates Bush. That is where Gwen Stefani would meet her future husband, Gavin Rossdale. It was by the time both Bush and No Doubt were touring together, Tragic Kingdom was around 175 on the Billboard chart. And within three months, the record would soon go platinum, and by August of 96, the album went double platinum, and the band was about to play for their biggest audience to date at the MTV Video Music Awards in September. Spin Magazine wanted to do a cover story on the band and they were really excited, but they soon learned that they only wanted Gwen on the cover and not the rest of the band members. Meanwhile, reg mags and internet gossip sites run rampant with rumors that Gwen was pregnant or getting engaged to Gavin Rossdale. Gwen would remark to USA Today how she'd come home from touring and her dad would show her these articles on the internet about Gavin and her. Girls soon started imitating Gwen's style, wearing baggies and having their hair in a ponytail. She would also be dubbed the anti-Courtney Love, the first alternative female rock star who didn't have a chip on her shoulder. As No Doubt looked to shoot the video for their mammoth single Don't Speak, Dumont's idea was to show the band breaking up and Tony would remark that if it looked like the band was acting mad at each other, it's because there was so much tension in the band, they didn't really have to act. Two months after Don't Speak would be released, Tragic Kingdom became the number one album in the US. By this point, the record was selling a whopping quarter of a million copies a week, and Don't Speak was garnering about 10,000 plays a week on radio. No doubt would spend two years on the road promoting their second album. Everything would come full circle when the band concluded their tour, playing a thank you concert to 30,000 screaming fans in their hometown of Anaheim. The band would put out several more singles for Tragic Kingdom, including Sunday Morning, Happy Now, as well as Hey You, and the last single would be released nearly three years after the album came out, giving it a super long shelf life. Tragic Kingdom went on to sell over 10 million copies just in the US alone, being certified diamond, and 16 million copies worldwide. No Doubt would be the only band to come out of the Orange County scene to have a number one album on the charts. There was an article that USA Today published in 1996 where they summarized the state of the music industry that read, Superstar albums stalled on the charts, exciting trends failed to materialize, record sales flattened, tours fizzled. 1996 has been a disappointing year for the music industry. On the other hand, there's no doubt who seemed to buck the trend. Stefani would be quoted as saying, None of us thought this could happen to a dorky band like us. By 1996, no doubt we're outselling more established bands like Hootie and the Blowfish, Pearl Jam, and R.E.M. I will say that the members in a lot of the interviews they gave seemed to not really let the fame go to their head, and they acknowledged that they were unlikely to match the success of Tragic Kingdom going forward, given how fickle the record industry is. At the time, Canal and Dumont were one semester short of getting their college degrees and intended at the time to go back to school as a backup. It was also said that by 1996, given all the band's success, Stefani and Canal were still living at home with their parents. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you guys want me to do a full blown history on No Doubt's entire career in the comment section below, and we'll see you again. Rock Vulture Story Sticker.